Welcome again to the game's top talk show on the road this season and tonight we're at Elland Road. Elland Road has been the home of Leeds United since they were voted into the league in 1920. The ground, council owned, is two miles southwest of the city centre and is also now the home of Hunslet Rugby League Club. The new £7 million pound East Stand seats 17,000 and is the largest cantilever structure of its kind in the world. Sky Sports Monday Night Football cameras were at Elland Road this week to see Gordon Strachan's 11th minute goal settle the match against Oldham. And Strachan in some space here, Jacks for Leeds United, and a goal! Leeds United lead, and Gordon Strachan answers his critics with a goal! And Gordon Strachan joins us tonight on the panel. We're also delighted to be in the company of Norman Bites Your Legs Hunter. We have with us Bill Fotherby, the managing director of Leeds United, and uh, England's former goalkeeper, Ray Clements. Welcome, all of you, gentlemen. Uh, the game last night, Gordon, where better to start? We came here under the impression there was a fair bit of pressure on Leeds United last night. Was that the case? There's a bit of pressure every time you play here to win a game, because the fans expect us to win here. Um, and obviously the media pressure had built up there to be a special game, but it wasn't really. We were just after the three points, because the way we've played football this year, We've deserved more points than what we've, we've got. Yeah, we got a bit of luck last night in the last 20 minutes, but before that, we were well in command and should have been up by two or three goals. Free scoring, Gordon Strachan, top scorer. That's right, ahead of the three million pound striker. He's watching. <laughs> <laughs> that means I get a very extra bill. <laughs> you get nothing from us then, Tom. Just keep scoring the goals. Keep scoring the goals. Norman, you were here last night. What did you make of it? I think the most important thing was the three points, because... Uh, the game wasn't much to look at as a specky, but uh, there was a little bit of pressure on the lads and uh, they, got, they got what they wanted, they got the three points because uh, you could see the last ten minutes, quarter of an hour, there was that anxiety creeping into them, but they did well. There were some good points, there was some, the lad in goal did well, the two centre defenders, the little right back. So all in all, it was uh, a good result. Just what you needed, Bill. Sorry, Bill, wasn't it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you needed, halfway up the table now, if there was any pressure, that removes it, doesn't it, the three points? Tremendous relief to get three points. Makes my bet look good now. What was your bet? Halfway up there. <laughs> Championship in the top three. That's where we'll finish. Is that a realistic target? Absolutely, absolutely. We've been unlucky to start with. Played very well at City, should have had four or five goals. Played well down at Arsenal. I'm not going to mention the Norwich game. But... Uh, we deserve more than we've, uh, we've got at the moment. Is that a fan talking or a businessman? Uh, a fan and a businessman, I think. Probably a fan talking, you know, you watch the game, you see it. And uh, we've been unfortunate. Best welcome you've had, Ray, isn't it? At the United. only welcome ever out here at Ellen Road. <laughs> <laughs> and so close as well. Yes. Be yeah, never been this close. And he's nice, isn't he, when you get this close to him? <laughs> <laughs> so far. Yes, yes. I was just wondering, I mean, last night it was a... Uh, it wasn't a spectacle, as Norman said, but uh, I just wondered from Gordon's point of view, was there a, you know, a, a special case of change in the way you play? Because you played so well in the first few games. Last night you seemed to go back to maybe what you've done when you were successful in terms of the longer ball. I don't know if you decided to change your tactics for that particular game Not to get the three points. Not at all. We just play the same way. Uh, if the long ball's on there to be played, you play it. That's the way we've been taught here. But there's no special, there's no like, real passing game. We don't pass 20 passes and we don't play a long ball. We, we like to think we can play any game that you ask us to play. If, if you've got players can run in behind, we'll have a long ball. Rodney Wallace can go in behind. Brian Dean can do it. I think that the, the first goal, the goal come from a long ball when Brian Dean flicked onto Rodney and Gary Speed got in there and I got in the end there. But no, no, but we just played the, the way we like to play it. But we got a bit of luck in the last 20 minutes when they scored and it was, it was offside. It, but the hard work we've been putting in before, as I say, we deserve more points than we've got. Mm. That was the allegation, of course, when you won the title, wasn't it? That you'd done it with the long ball. Did that hurt a little bit? I wish that room. <laughs> Is that Andy Gray? <laughs> Martin, <laughs> Martin Tyler, quick. There's a, there's, let's get it right. There's a difference between the long ball and the long pass. When Roman, Ronald Koeman or Glenn Hoddle hits a long ball, it's a long pass. When somebody who's not got that charisma hits a long pass, it's a long ball. There's a difference between a long pass and a long ball. We try to pass the ball long. We don't thump into corners and but he chases after it and we try and get through ones. That's, that's, that's different. That's what they tell you at Anfield, of course, as well, isn't it? 
just sounded like Bill Shankly there, didn't he? The way he was talking there. <laughs> I used to watch Liverpool. I studied Liverpool for years. And I watched, I've watched them for the last 10 years. And they didn't take many chances in the first half of many games. I watched lots of Liverpool games over the last 15 years. In the first half, they put a lot of balls in behind. They didn't make many mistakes. And then when the game died a bit and people weren't closing them down so much, then they started that passing game. Mm. They didn't try and pass to start with. Nobody's got to allow you just to pass the ball. No, there was a ball. Very Tot back. Tottenham found that out last week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very true what, what Gordon's saying is that at Liverpool, and I'm sure it still goes on today, is that, yes, they want to pass the ball and everything, but early on in the game, when it's very, very tight like that, you keep getting a shout from the bench, and it was when Shanks was there and when Ronnie Moran was there, it would be, turn them. And all you're trying to do is stretch the game out, so you try and turn they the opposition back They wouldn't try and drive a ball from front to back for rush. No, no, they wouldn't just do it willy-nilly, but they would do it if they felt they were being pressurised and there was no space to play in the middle of the field. Then they would turn the back four and try and stretch the game out, and then you could play in the middle of the field then. Just got to look at uh, the game against Liverpool. Leeds had all the second half in Liverpool. They were two up, and they just sat and they just soaked it up. Then they go and they just sat there, soaked it up, and tried to hit you on the break. I don't think they soaked it up. You know, they didn't... They go out that way in the second half. I spoke to the coach after Roy Moran and he says Leeds played that well, they just couldn't get out. They just couldn't get out. That's encouraging for you. Uh, Bill, something in the news today, you have been found guilty, both Leeds United and Manchester United, of misconduct by not allowing under 18 year olds on this pre-youth championship tour. Your reaction to that please? Well I just hope it, it's not going to be a fine. <laughs> I hope they're not going to ask for money. <laughs> And if it is a GM, by the way, if it is a fine, if it is a fine, I hope it's a suspended fine. <laughs> but uh, you know what, uh, Howard Wilkinson has done since he's been here. Uh, he's brought some of these youngsters on, uh, which you can see coming through now, and he's looking after the uh, youngsters. You've got Peter Gumby here, who's been a tremendous asset to this club. You've got Paul Art now in there, who used to play with Leeds looking after the youngsters, caring for them. And you know, the future, I don't want to get too deep into this, but the future for football is, is in youngsters, bringing them through. You can't forever go on and going out and paying three million pounds for footballers and two million pounds. There comes an end to it. You know, now you see that there's only a few clubs at the top that are doing that, you know? But it's these youngsters, and the, Howard Wilkinson is looking after these youngsters. And he feels for them. And if he thinks that they're playing too many games, we back him 200%. I was just about to ask you that. Did Howard Wilkinson come to the board and say, I am going to do this? Was it his decision? And were you unanimously behind him? Absolutely. It? Absolutely. He came and you do us. the same again? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Even if they find you? Even if they find us, which I hope they don't. I'm, I, I know they'll be looking <laughs> in tonight, but please, please. <laughs> <laughs> the letter's in the post. OK, that's where we'll take a short break. More in a moment uh, from the Footballers Football Show. Welcome back to the Footballers Football Show. On the road, of course, this season tonight from Elland Road, Leeds United's ground. Ray Clements, just continuing that discussion on youngsters, the future, which plainly they are, the future of the game. Tottenham had a real old rack last year, didn't they, when the FA wanted Nicky Barmby and you didn't want to release him? Yes, it's a very vital time in, in Tottenham's season. We were in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. We had Manchester City away. It was, you know, our league position was, was safe and our only chance of any glory was in the FA Cup. And Nicky Barmby had been instrumental in us being successful since the Christmas period, so he was the last person that we needed to lose. Was that the only reason why you didn't want no, to go? No, it wasn't the only reason. Or do you think also <laughs> that there's too much pressure on young players, too many games? Well, I think for tournaments like that, they don't need to go out there. I think they would get far more experience playing in the first team in one of the best leagues in the world, which is the Premiership League. Um, I think with Nicky Barnby as well, we knew he had a slight problem with his shin splints, and we were making sure that we rested him when we could and played him when we could, but we knew the problem, so therefore we treated it the right way. Mm. But the FA were adamant that they took him out there, um, and they didn't rest him, and because of that, we hardly had his services at all after that for the rest mm. of the season. And in fact, the lad now has had an operation, and he's going to be at least two months before he contributes to Tottenham season this year. So it's, it's been a nightmare for the club, really. So you've got to be careful with them, Norman. Yeah, you have. But I think Leeds United's a prime example. When you think, like, back end of last season, there was a lot of the youngsters actually went into the side, and then they, they went and won the Youth Cup, didn't they? Game the Wheelings, the Foresters. And, and so all these people, you know, and then 
that was those 64,000 people watched them two games against the youths. And, and if they're in the first team, it's a tiring experience to come in and in the first team. It's emotional and it's also physical. Mm -hmm. And if you've got tours and all on top of that, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, let's remember they're still growing, aren't they? You know, they're 18, they're still growing. And, uh, you know, even lower down, kids that sort of 13, 14 and 15 are expected to play for their school, for their district, for their county, for the professional club they're associated with. It's just so many games for them. They're playing virtually every day of the week. Mm. And, you know, a lot of them, it, it hampers their development. Uh, they just outgrow their strength, and when they outgrow their strength, they then get injuries, mm. and it sets them back. I don't think there's nothing wrong with playing the many games, Ray. Because as a kid, I, I played, I don't know, four or five games a week. I played when I got home, till 10 o'clock at night. Then you used to hide when you, you knew your mother was going to shout on you. Around the corner, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to play the time, but the problem is pressurised football. Yeah. Yeah. That is the difference. We can play, kids can play every day of the week for four or five hours, no problem. It's pressurised football, and that's when they get mentally tired. And that could have been the problem with other kids that in last year. Foresters, Sharp, yeah. uh, uh, Tinklers, they come in, and we were under pressure at the time. And these lads were having to play mentally, and they had to play in an FA Cup, Youth Cup final here, and 64,000 people over two legs. Mentally they were shattered. Yeah. What they wanted then was just a break for football to get the recharge the batteries again. Physically they might have done it, but mentally these kids were knackered. I think, they needed a, rest. I think there is a directive or the, the discuss, discussions between the FA and the clubs at the moment that certainly the more talented youngsters they're going to try and restrict to 40 games a season, I think. Mm. They don't play any more than that. I want to ask you about Peter Reid's sacking in a moment, but before we go on, let's get some reaction out here to Leeds United's season so far. Is there anybody here agreeing with Gordon Strachan? Leeds are playing well and should have more points. Yes. Which way do we... Yes, down here. Yes, I think Leeds have played very well this season. I think they've been unfortunate on the travels. I think, strangely enough, probably the worst performance we've given was last night when we got the three points. That was all important. Mm. Yes, it so, was indeed. I think we're very unfortunate that we gave a good performance at Arsenal and uh, Liverpool and we've been punished for it, just the odd mistake, being yeah. cost us daily. When are Leeds United going to win away from home again, Gordon? Well, so Why can't put a bet on it. <laughs> Southampton, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's rephrase well, the question. I accept it was a silly question. I said that at Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't Leeds win away from home? I don't know, probably because they don't pick me. Glad you answered that. Big man. Glad you answered that. Over to you. Well, uh, did I jump in, uh, Gordon? Carry on, jump in. Uh, maybe because they don't pick me, I, d I don't know. Uh, it's <laughs> one of them things, you know, Gordon, it keeps leaving theory. me out. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a bit like a, a, a golfer with the yips. You know, you try your best to overcome it. But when you get in front of that pot, whoops, and you, you practice, you practice, and you suddenly get there. But you can only keep trying. And that's what we're getting for the team and the players anyway, we're getting the effort. But, but I feel a lot more confident now than I did maybe March, April time last year mm. when we didn't look in the best of shapes. Mm. We looked confused. And that's the worst thing for a football player. It's even worse than losing confidence when you're confused. You don't know where to go. Now we know how to put it right and we're not far away. Mm. Was that, when we arrived last night, we started to get the impression it was a big game for Leeds United last night because of the things that we'd read in the papers like you. Was that a big game for Leeds? I don't think it was a big game uh, because it's so early on in the season. I think uh, trouble is uh, we've been just finding on one cylinder. I think uh, goalkeeper, front goalkeeper Lukic has been very poor. Uh, and I think, uh, to be honest, I don't think we've been playing with the captain. I think since McAllister got captaincy, um, his game has suffered terrific, you know, he's, he's been, he hasn't been the same player since last year when he got the captaincy. Um, we have, we've played without a leader. Gordon's hoping Bill jumps in again here, well, I think. Uh, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know if Gordon would be answer. To be honest, I thought the bloke who would be captain at the beginning of the season would be O'Leary because he had 20 years experience with Arsenal, 15 as captain and you know, he's, he's a lot more experienced than McAllister. Okay, it's a fair question, I don't Gordon. think it makes a difference, Richard, who's captain. When you get out in the park, I think you all... Some are better leaders than others, you know, like we had a captain in Billy Bremner. Yeah, but last but, night, Norman, McAllister didn't play at all, did he? All right, well, that's that's nothing to, Norman, that, take the question. That's nothing to do with him being captain. He's probably a lad's just having mm. a bad time or something like that. Because the responsibility doesn't wait. You like to be captain. Now, the manager would have asked him if he wanted to be captain, and he said yes. And uh, when you get out there, like, uh, Billy was our captain, but we had Big Jack with Johnny Jack with other people that would tell you what to do. And I suppose it's the same if Gordon's not captain. He'll tell people what to do and other people in the team. I don't think that's a pressure at all. I think I'd like to go back to the, the gentleman's first point about the pressure last night's game. 
I think that pressure was brought on a lot by the irresponsible comments by, made by, what's the name of that group? Bleeds Action, Action Group. group. Yeah. Action Group. You know, farcical, who are, who are these people? You know, the Leeds well, Action Group. Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody well, you knows get some support that. out here, I think, on that one, you Gordon. Know. Yeah. I went in supporters club last night and people were asking me, who's this Matt Taylor? Nobody seems to know. You're asking around it. Invisible man. Evidently, all he's got is a season ticket and a fax machine. That's the only contact he's got. <laughs> You know, that, the Leeds Action Committee, I don't know if anybody's seen the film The Life of Brian. It puts your mind to the Judean people's front. And there's a, there's a scene in there where they, they say, well, we need to get rid of the Romans, because they've done nothing for us. And they all start saying, well, what about sanitation? What about education? What about the viaducts? What the about roads, the, the roads, walls. The roads, everything like that. Apart from that, apart from that. It's the same with Howard Wilkins. Mm. What has Wilkins never done for us? Yeah. Apart from saving us from the third division, getting the second division title, getting the first division title, one of the charity shield, getting us into Europe, changing the image of the whole club, bringing one of the youth team cup here, bringing great players here. Apart from that, what's Wilkins ever done? <laughs> Thank you. Terrific, unanimous applause as well. That's great. I think one of Leeds' major problems this season and last has been the lack of a major central defensive figure. I think when you look at the likes of Manchester United who've got Bruce and Pallister, I don't like mentioning them in here of course, but uh, <laughs> you look at Tottenham who's got a guy like Gary Mabbott, then you've got Liverpool where we went on Saturday, what's got Ruddock and Wright. No disrespect to the lads that we've got, but I think the likes of Chris Fairclough and John Newsom and David Weatherall will play well against actually a, a strong character. But when you put them together, I think, in my opinion anyway, I'm not quite sure about the rest of the fans, but you think when you're up against the likes of Pace, of Ian Wright and Paul Merson mm -hmm. and Ryan Giggs, right. it's very nerve-wracking right from the start. Actually, and you know I have a that question. I think we've um, had Gordon's defence. Norman. Thanks, Richard. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what David O'Leary was brought in for, wasn't he? Because you look at the situation, you've got two young lads there. I think Weatherall's got a chance of being a centre-half. I, I personally like John Newsom. I think he's got a great chance to be a centre-half. And I think David O'Leary was brought in to play alongside whichever one it was, it could have been Chris Fairclough, because I saw them at Manchester City, and as a pair, they were excellent. If, if Leeds had won 6-1, nobody could have complained. But unfortunately, David O'Leary's got himself injured, he's done his uh, Achilles tendon, so he's going to be out for a number of weeks now, or probably months. And, and that is a big, severe blow. But uh, it, it's difficult, there's just not the money, and there's not, you can't, there's not that many central defenders you can go out and buy and bring in without spending your two and three million pounds. Mm. You've got to produce your youths. And whether all in Newsom, or whether it be Fairclough, and O'Leary, as long as David O'Leary gets himself fit and plays alongside one of them, I think they'll be all right. All right, let's broaden it a little bit. Should Manchester City have stuck by Peter Reid for a little longer than they have? Ray, what did you make of Peter Reid's dismissal? <clears throat> well, I think that it was very abrupt, wasn't it? Four games into the season. I mean, Peter Reid in his three previous seasons, I think, had finished fifth on two occasions and ninth on the third occasion. <laughs> And, uh, you know, four games into the season, I mean, it's nothing. I mean, I remember Manchester United, I think, lost the first two games of last season. And they went on and won the championship. So, it's very early days to be making judgments. But, uh, obviously, Peter Swales, as he has done in the past, decided it was time for a change. He got fed up and decided to bring somebody else in to do the work and get rid of uh, Peter Reid. Yeah, Gordon, um, I just like to say, you know, thanks for praising Howard Wilkinson there. But I'd actually like to... Uh, praise you, the way you brought all the lads over to the fans after the Liverpool game. Thanks, thanks very much for that, because we appreciated that a lot. Had a yeah, question on that last week? Yeah. Great, fair enough. Okay. Can I ask Gordon what he thinks about the, uh, the support on the travels lately, because I think it's been one of the big plus factors of the, uh, of the away debate. Um, I think the, the supporters have been absolutely tremendous. I, I was sat at Anfield uh, in the main stand uh, and about five or six seats away from the cop end and the cop were in full flow, but all I could hear were the Leeds United supporters at the other Well, they're side. famous for their support, aren't they, both at home and away. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'd just like to get away from Leeds a little bit, if we may. Anybody got anything to contribute on the dismissal of Peter Reid? Anybody got anything to... No, who cares? All right. <laughs> OK, down here. Right down the far end. Here we go. 
Oops, not, here we go. Sorry, it's not just about Peter Reid. I think it's English football. Uh, I personally think it's run by people that have never ever kicked a ball in their lives before. Uh, Peter Swales, is it Peter Swales? He's the, he's the top man in the FA that fires and fires the managers. And as, what's he ever done? Apart from add a load of money and put a load of money into a football club, is, these people are running football club uh, and football in general, and they've they've never kicked a ball in their lives. Fair enough. <laughs> so well, how many balls have you it? kicked in your time? I've had a couple of contacts really? with the ball. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I have kicked a few balls in my time. I uh, don't want to go back uh, into the history books, but I was a Buckley boy, yeah. Probably the audience are too young to remember Major Buckley. But uh, I did kick one or two balls. Not good, mind. But uh, I was told after two years that I wasn't good enough, and I went to play for Fairway Athletic, which I think uh, many Leeds uh, supporters would know. And I think I was a record goal scorer by scoring 36 goals from f the full back position in one season. He was never back there defending. That's that was right. <laughs> You've skirted around the question, which Absolutely. really was. And you know what the question was. People running the game that have never done it out on the park, and why is that? Well, they get involved in football. It's like, I think, why does somebody come prominent in the union organisations because he goes to every meeting and he attends it and he gets involved. I wanted to be involved at Leeds United so I, I wrote letter after letter to uh, Keith Archer and to Manny Cousins. I think it took me about uh, 12 years before I got the opportunity uh, to join the board but I was persistent and I wanted to be on because I felt I could do a good job for Leeds. Uh, because I felt like that gentleman has said, I felt at the time that the board were not doing what they should do. And uh, I think that's what happens. Peter Swales is the uh, chairman of the uh, FA and uh, selection committee. And he's there at every meeting. I couldn't do that. I've got enough on at Leeds United with a job I have. It's a 24-hour job. My wife never knows where I am. I haven't got the time to be on the FA and going uh, overseas to Switzerland and to Germany and seeing players there or whatever he does. I couldn't do that. Okay. Gordon, were you going to say something? The, the Man City thing. I think it'd be a lot easier or the second managers if you sign a contract and nobody can break it. It'd be as simple as that. If you sign for five years, then you are the manager for five years and you can't resign and take a post elsewhere either because you come in, the manager's preach loyalty to the players and suddenly they're off, they resign and they go somewhere else. I think it'd be a lot easier if the chairman says, it's your five year contract, you have to stay for five years, it can't be broken. That's right. It's simple you, then. You pick the man initially and you pick him because you think he's the right guy and you give him the five year contract. Should, should abide by it, both managers it's, and directors. If he doesn't want a five year contract, say to the manager, what do you want? Do you want one, two, three, four, That's and it's right. up to him. Then you know where you stand, then you can plan for that time with that manager. Yeah. I think it's a fundamental question of uh, loyalty and contracts in that um, how can a board and a manager expect his players to not be unsettled, to not listen to rumour and everything else when they're being attracted by other clubs for example while under contract if boards like the Manchester City board set an example as they have which basically means your contract is worthless we decide whether we want you or don't want you, even during that contract, and basically pay you off. But on the same, in the same breath, they'll moan about a player who's going in during contract to renegotiate his terms mm. or, or otherwise. Put that to Bill in a moment. We'd just like to welcome Gary Schofield, Great Britain's uh, rugby league captain, who's joined us in the audience as well. Good to see you, Gary. Not enough loyalty, I'd just though. like to say one thing on that particular point, and it's an embarrassing situation being a, a, a director of a football club, and it's a pain barrier, which I hope that I never have to go through until I retire from this club in the job that I'm doing, because it is a very difficult time you have when that has to happen. Um, Howard Wilkinson has lost three games at Leeds United, but I can assure you one thing that... Uh, uh, Howard Wilkinson is 
setting concrete here. It's going to take some powder keg to move him, what, for whatever reason, because we know here at least, we know the job that he's doing. We know, I believe, uh, that you've got to be involved in a football club. It's not one like the days of Al Reid or uh, one of them comedians uh, being a director. You come down once a month or you come down once a week to find out what's happening, how many toilet rolls have been bought and uh, uh, what's happening, where's that money going from here? And top me, today it's a big job. It's, I'm not just saying it because I have it, but you've got to be down and be involved in it because you've got to know what the manager's doing. And there's one thing about Howard Wilkinson. He listens to you. You can have a conversation with him. He's not frightened for you to come and talk to him. Mm. You know, he's part... Big man? When did that start? <laughs> <laughs> you never speak to him anyway, so it's not <laughs> but you have to get close. The chairman, whoever it is, or the managing director, the directors have to be close to what's happening in the club. And not on a whim from a newspaper uh, cutting or whatever, you've got to be with the manager. OK, that's a, a nice more. way to end it. We'll take a powder cake to move Howard Wilkinson. We'll be back here at Ellen Road with more on the Footballers Football Show in a moment or so, talking particularly about player managers. Welcome back to the Footballers Football Show from Elland Road this week. That's the home of Leeds United, of course. We're in the company of Ray Clements and one of Leeds' finest, Norman Hunter. We also have with us Bill Fotherby, the managing director of the club, and Gordon Strachan. The subject of player managers. Why is everybody looking away? <laughs> is it possible to play and manage at the very highest level? Has there ever been a successful player manager? Ray? Well, I think uh, most people in this room would remember one certain person, and that would be Kenny Dalglish. Mm -hmm. And I think you could say he was reasonably successful in the probably two years that he actually played and managed at the same time. As it went on, he had to come away from the playing side. But I think it is a, it's a very, very difficult uh, job to do, because as all the lads around this table w would tell you, that there is so much to do as, as a manager, that um, to actually play and manage becomes a very, very difficult job. But Kenny did make a success of it, but he had a fantastic backup in, in the squad that he had at Liverpool. And there are degrees of success, of course, and that's the best example that you could have come up with. Has anybody else managed it, Norman? Well, if you drop down a division, you can do it. Because if you come down from the Premier to the First, you, you're dropping slightly in standard of play, and you can do that, that little bit better. Even if you're not playing that well yourself, you can still be better than what, what what you're playing, what's in your team. As Glenn uh, Hoddle did last season. As Glenn Hoddle did, as a lot of people have done. But uh, I think you can only do it for a short space of time. I think I did it for about a year and a half. And then injuries, and as Ray says, the pressures of the job and everything else catches up with you. And what you do need when you are doing it, man, you need it anyway, you need a right good staff. If you've got a good staff, which Kenny did at the time, then if you're a good player, mind you, he was a bit of class though, wasn't he? He could, he could play and... But you can go on that little bit longer if you've got a good staff. But if you haven't got the staff you want, then you've got to come away from the playing and you've got to concentrate more on the management side. But it can be done, but it's hard work. Is it not a problem, though, that when, you've had a, when you're having a bad game in the first 45 minutes and we've all had nightmares, we want to, want to get in that dressing room quick and bury your head in a bucket somewhere, and you as the player manager, as having a bad game, you've got to come in at half-time and try and motivate everybody else. Is that not a problem? Well, it, it is a slight problem, but... Uh, I think they know what you can do, the players, I think. Uh, they know what level you've played at and what you have done when you've played. And it, it's, it wasn't a problem when, when I was there, you know. Uh, but uh, I think then that's when you need your number two. That's so when he... No, it's not a problem. <laughs> that's when you need your number two. Because you can go so far yourself and then you say, right, I've said enough, over to you. And then he, you can take a seat and then you can be told off as a player. But that is when you've got to have a very, very good staff. Mind you, if Norman came in the dressing room at half-time, Ray, and asked you to perform, you'd perform, wouldn't you? Sorry? <laughs> I tell you what, even then I might, if he asked me. <laughs> Don't really fancy him anyway. <laughs> Do you fancy? Player managing at some time, Gordon? Yeah, I just watched it in again. The smashing game. I was taken back Norman's point. I think, maybe disagree with you a bit there, Norman. I think Graham Soonest did at Rangers as well. I think that the higher you go up, the greater club, I think that 
administration looks after itself. I think if you, the further you go down, I think a lot of the administration what gets passed to you, mm. it doesn't give enough time to stay with the players and things like that. I think Kenny had a great, I mean, just Liverpool looked after itself. Yeah. And up there, when I mean, uh, Graham went up there, he got a lot of backroom staff in and they looked after that and he looked after the, the players. I think it can be a bit harder the further you go, go down. My, my best friend is at Reading, Matt McGee, and he tried to do the player manager, but uh, he found it near impossible playing and coaching his side and administration. He had to do everything himself. Uh, and the playing side went and his training went, you know. And uh, I spoke to Matt recently and I said, how are you doing? He says, well, if you can judge the success of a club by the, the size of the, the, the manager's waistline, we're doing very well. Because mm. Matt's put on the beef, you know, now because he's not training anymore. Uh, so he's had to pack in the playing side. Well, the problem is as well, isn't it, is that when you're a manager, you're travelling around all over the place to see games, to see teams that you're coming up against in the next week or so. So you're, you're, you're finishing up working all day, then driving, driving up the motorway for two or three hours, watching a game, coming back, doing a report, and going into training the following morning when you should be sharp and ready to train, and you're actually shattered, mm. and that's when you finish up tearing muscles and then missing, missing games. So I'm not trying to get him fixed up elsewhere, Bill, but it, it interests mm. me to hear that Gordon said he would, at some point, like to try to play and manage. Now, see, Brian Robson and Ray Wilkins are both of the opinion they want to play until they can't play anymore because it's so enjoyable. They don't want the extra burden of management. What, what appeals to you about that then? Well, first of all, I, I love football. I love the camaraderie of the game. I think Ray and Norman will say that's probably the thing you miss. Norman. The camaraderie and the people you meet in the game, well, most people you meet in the game, are smart. <laughs> uh, I was looking at him. <laughs> But I, I, th I don't think there's. My mother's watching, so I, be careful. I don't think there's a, this is a secret. But in the summer, I, I was thinking about maybe going in and being a player manager. I thought, well, I've done as much as I can at Leeds, and I thought maybe a player manager because I, I get that coaching bug every now and then. Then I thought no, about, so and I thought about the the hard, the, the the work that you've got to put in is phenomenal. And to prepare for a game, I wouldn't be able to do what I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years in the way I prepared. And I think I'd be shortchanging what any, any team I went and been a. I'd lose out as a player. I think if you can play as long as you can, you've got to. If well, you but still the, the, the park big Ron actors had told me, and, and, and the rest they put into the people that told me about this, and you'd have to go with this game and yeah. that game, you go away to kill it, watch yeah, the game. Yeah. And you miss neighbours, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be still at the training ground. I thought, oh, that's <laughs> not for me. Okay. You know. See, with Gordon, I know Gordon would like that kind of thing, and I think Howard Wilkinson realises that too, and the backroom stuff. And uh, what's happening at Leeds over the last six years, five years, is that there's a cake being made. And I said to Gordon when he came into uh, my office, Howard, he had a word with Howard, and Howard then pushes him over for the crossing the T's and dotting the I's to me, and we had a little chat. And we know here that, that we don't want a piece of that cake to go. We copy clubs, Manchester United. When I got the job first off here, I rang Martin Edwards and asked him if I could go over there and have a word with him. I did the same with Peter Robinson. What we need here is what we had years and years ago with Don Revy. It was solid. You don't want a piece of that cake missing. Mm. You know, to take Gordon from that cake now would be a big mistake. Because his influence round the club Sorry about that. You've, you've got to Let me have my contracts <laughs> underneath there. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'd like to say, though, that if, if you'd like to just sign up yeah. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to put the point that I didn't want to play with any of the other club bar Leeds as just a football player. This is the only place I want to play because out there is the best, you know, arena to play football, the atmosphere. You just switch on and go out. That's the reason I keep playing it. People mm -hmm. say, how do you play? I, I love the atmosphere. I love the camaraderie of the club out there is where I like playing. You know, so it's a magnificent place. I'm sorry to embarrass you, Gordon. I've got to ask, though, because what you've said leads me to. Bill, are you saying that Gordon Strachan is a future manager of Leeds United? No, I didn't say, I didn't say that. I said we don't want to lose him now. Right. That's why we've signed him on a contract as a player. But he's so influential here, everybody at the club, Howard, particularly Howard, he knows he's a clever man. Clever boy, Howard. <laughs> it was very popular at one time to get a player to manage a club, particularly in the lower leagues, Norman, because yeah. presumably you got two for one job. Yeah. Two for the price of one. Why did you go for Howard Wilkinson? And how did you manage...
to get him to step out of the first division to the bottom of the second when you brought him here? I don't know. I think probably his answer to, his answer to that was, because I asked him that question, why would you come to Leeds from Sheffield Wednesday, Howard? And he said, because there is so much potential at Leeds. That's why I'd like the opportunity of coming to Leeds. And uh, we wanted him. He had, I did speak to Bobby Robson, the England manager, and uh, he said, Bill, the best manager you can have to get you out of the second division is Howard Wilkinson. And no better advice uh, as Leeds United had over the past 15 years. And you had to speculate a bit as well, didn't you? Gave him a few bob to spend in order to complete the task that he Well, uh, to we were very fortunate in having a chairman like Leslie Silver, who puts his money where his mouth is, and uh, he wants... Uh, he, has a, he has a saying amongst his colleagues and friends, I've made so much money from this city, I want to put something back into the city for the people and the supporters. And this is exactly what he's doing. He's getting great joy from doing what he does and uh, uh, he's the best asset that anybody could have. He's not just a, a walker that ploughs his money in, he's a businessman. He wants a return on his money and he'll get that. If you, if you go back a few years, Leeds United didn't have an asset. Mm. Now look at the assets that they have now on the field. Look at the players. Look what's happening. Good. Good. Raymond. How can you follow a man like this? I mean, he just goes on and, and that's You haven't got it. the question yet, which is, why don't goalkeepers make good managers? Who says they don't? <laughs> hey? Is that your personal feeling or everybody's feeling? I think that uh, goalkeepers can make very good managers. And I don't want to be sat here for the rest of this season. I want to be back in management. Good. As simple as that. Um, they haven't been given maybe the chances they should have been. Maybe there's a, a feeling in football that goalkeepers don't. But there have been a number of goalkeepers over the years who have made a decent job of it. Dino Zoff, who you know, manages Lazio, it's hardly a small club and he's done a very successful job there. He's got them into European football this year for the first time for goodness knows how long. Brian Clough's assistant, Peter Taylor, was a goalkeeper and I'm sure that uh, he influenced Brian in his early days. Don Mackay, who, who was at uh, Blackburn, did a very, very successful job there and just failed without the sort of money that Kenny's had to get them up into the, into the top division. So there has been goalkeepers who, who make a Mike decent Walker. job. Okay, I mean, Mike Walker, there are one or two more, but is, is there a feeling Wallace, in the game, just... Jock Wallace, of course, is there a feeling in the game that, that goalkeepers don't make managers? I think there possibly is, and until it's been, until it's been proved wrong, and it has been proved wrong in a minor way, um, it's just a case of being given the opportunity, and I certainly want that opportunity because uh, I believe I've been in the game 20 odd years, 26 years, 27 years, and uh, all right, I've not been in amongst the all the running around that uh, Norman did and Gordon did, but I've stood at the back for 26 years and I've seen everything that can happen in that game, whether it be from forward players, whether it be from defensive players. I've been managed by Bill Shankly, Don Revy, Ron Greenwood, Joe Mercer, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan, Keith Birkinshaw, David Pleat, you name them, I've been managed by quite a lot of very, very good managers. Um, and I've picked up bits from all of them and as as uh, Gordon would say, you know, you pick up from people that you associate with and it only all the good things rub off on you. Mm. I think it's very unfair and goalkeeper saying that actually because it, there's, there's no guarantee to being a, a successful manager, there's no stereotype in being a, you, there's no plan of being a good football player. Look at the World Cup side in 66, I mean, who's been only successful? One, the, the most ordinary football player on the side has been the best manager probably. Uh, correct me, Jack question. Charlton. You don't, you, know, be, you, you don't have to be a good player to be a good manager. If you look at the, the real successful managers in the world, Jock Steen very early played at top level. Satchi uh, of uh, AC Milan didn't play at the top level. Andy Roxburgh was the manager of Scotland. And Graham Taylor was never the greatest football player. But the, and Howard Wilkinson was... <laughs> I don't know what set myself up that. <laughs> By the way, I set you up for that, I'm Scottish, do you know how... Uh, Howard, Howard was not a top class footballer. But, I think, and Alec Ferguson wasn't a great football player, but what they do have that some of the top, the, the great players 
maybe lose when they stop playing football? Is it the desire, the hunger, that they've used up all their energy to win and win and win and win? Well, as the more ordinary players, I've still got that burn, burning ambition to be a success in football. And I think that's what takes them on to, to be great managers. That's an interesting theory. We're quiet out here, incidentally, because week. it's so interesting. Go on, Bill, sorry. Pity you didn't ask the question last week. You might have got the City job after that. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, how many people in the audience think that goalkeepers wouldn't make a good manager? Let's, let's find out. Who thinks that goalkeepers... Would, let's have a little quick poll here again, because we like doing this. Who thinks goalkeepers don't make managers? Can I see those four people outside <laughs> afterwards, please? <laughs> the rest, presumably, <laughs> think goalkeepers, like anybody else, can manage football clubs. Norman? I don't think there's many really... I think this guy probably, there's not many want to do it, is there? If you ask a goalkeeper, I think it's such a specialised job, they just probably want to be a goalkeeper and then finish. Or oh, they go into specialised coaching, don't they? They go into being, coaching the youngsters or coaching the first team goalkeeper in the reserves. They very rarely want to go in as managers, but the ones that have been mentioned have been fairly successful, haven't they? And what about Gordon's theory on that the more successful players maybe don't make as good a managers because they've, 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 they've burnt up the desire that they had or... I think the situation there is that the successful players have seen things at the top end and have been judged at the best and have had the best players around them. So when you come out of that playing situation then go into a management situation, it may not be at the top level. And if you've been involved at the top level for say 10, 15, 20 years, if you're not careful you will judge the players you are now ha handling at the level that you've been playing and there is a big difference between the two and that's getting the balance right is that you can't expect players in a lower division to play the way that you've played at the top level and you have to make those adjustments and get the balance right and then you can be successful. Norman nodding away. Yeah I think, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean did you find that a problem when you went down a division? Do you expect more of your players than well, you, you do, cook, yeah, 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 because you know, like you're used to certain things, and and you set up any drills and any ex any uh, sort of training sessions, and you're asking them to do things that you think are fairly easy, and and, and it's difficult for them. So really, then, when you do go down, it's more down to organisation. You've got to get them more organised. They've got to know exactly what they're going to do. They've got to know what pattern they're going to play, and then within that. If you want them to play football, then to play football or whatever they want to do on top of that. If they want to hit the long ball, you do that. Okay, I've Put got it. the names and addresses from back here, by the way. Thanks very much, Richard. It's nothing. <laughs> okay. That's where we'll take another break. More in a moment or so on the Footballers Football Show. We'll be discussing next week's uh, England International. back to the Footballers Football Show. We're in the company tonight of Gordon Strachan and Bill Fotherby, who's the Managing Director at Leeds United. We also have one of Leeds and England's finest, Norman Hunter, and Ray Clements is with us once again. Uh, before we talk about next week's match, England-Poland, live, of course, here on Sky Sports, let's get some questions from out here on the floor. Gary Schofield, welcome. Good to see you. Good evening, Richard. Good evening, fellas. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question what um, was in the paper the, the other week with Howard Wilkinson regarding uh, the transfer system because Gordon was mentioned earlier about players maybe wanting to get out of their contracts. What about maybe so the clubs and how not spending all the money every you know, five or six weeks? What about putting a ban on it where you can just buy the players, say, between December and January to stop all the monopoly going on? Good question. Who wants to take it? Yeah, I'll take it. It's, uh, I think it's a very, very good idea. I think that, um, that there should be a, a month or six weeks in the summer when you could buy and then a month at some stage in the season and around Christmas would be ideal. I think there has to be that window in the season because to be fair to all the clubs you could have a horrendous run of injuries. It's not your fault, it's just the way it's happened and you need one or two players to see you through the season so I think you should have that window but I would be quite in favour of having transfers just done in the summer and for maybe a two-week period. But that's okay, Ray, if, if, if you're one of the big clubs and you, you can afford to get by with what you've got. But if you're one of the smaller ones, as Norman knows, having managed down the leagues, you need to sell every now and again, Norman, don't you, just to survive? Yeah, yeah you do. You do, yeah. You've got to sell. You've got to sell to keep going. And also, the, the, I, I don't know that much. Uh, there's people better qualified than me try to sort it out. But I would say that uh, if you could probably loan players more in the lower divisions, you know, instead of going out and buying them, when you've sold a player, probably loan one, you know, and have a better system that way for the lower divisions. Okay, over here. 
Picking up on the point that we've got Gary Schofield in the audience, um, I think football would learn a lot from rugby league uh, with various rules such as time wasting injuries which they don't have and swearing. Any swearing happens in rugby league. There's an immediate 10 yard penalty, etc. Yet. <laughs> Yet yeah, very often on uh, we, we see, especially on Sky TV, any swearing, especially directed to the referee, goes amiss. So I'd like to think what the panel think of that. Doesn't happen. First of all, you it? should have seen Gary's face when you said there was no swearing in rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon, well, I could easily make it from one 18-yard box to another. <laughs> Easy. And once, you had one blast at a referee. Well, yes, you had a quite an interesting discussion with that linesman last night, didn't you? I did, yeah. He got me back, though, didn't he? He got me offside. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> okay, I had some over here, away on the left, didn't I? Down this side. Here we go. Yeah, now that we've got uh, improved stadia in this country, isn't it about time that the England football team started playing some of the games away from Wembley? What, what does the panel think? Phil? Well, I'd like to see uh, England play at Ellen Road. Uh, <laughs> what a surprise. I don't know whether you notice, I'm wearing the 1996 European Champions uh, badge, which we hope to have at uh, Ellen Road very shortly. This is the plug-in. And uh, I hope it comes and it's made official. So, yes, we're building a stadium which is worthy of uh, some of these international games. What about from a player's point of view? Norman? Don't I think players like to go to Wembley? Yeah, you love to go to Wembley. England. You love to go to Wembley. That's a place to go. And uh, when you get your first cap and then, you know, you pull that shirt on, it happens to be at Wembley. That's what it's all about. But uh, the, other the side, stadium's one is good then. Sorry. It's, it's not so cheap, is it? Football's an expensive business to watch now. Yes. Yeah. Trip to London's. It's the, other thing, it's the other thing as well, I, I, I think that some of the smaller games, um, like say, say San Marino, you're never going to fill Wembley with San Marino. If you brought it to Leeds United, how many people would come and see San Marino? They'll only want the big games up here, and the big games you can fill a stadium at Wembley for, and I think as Norman says, if you're going to fill the stadium, then Wembley's the place it has to be, because it has such a tremendous atmosphere, and the players are motivated, or should be motivated, yeah. by playing in there. <laughs> I'd just like to ask the panel, especially Gordon and Ray, they've got lads that are playing football now and I would imagine quite well, especially Ray, Ray, Ray's lads being on the telly, quite competitive. What do they feel about junior football and where do you think it should start as a competitive age? These are your two boys, are they? Well, this is one of, this is oh. my lad and this is the other lad that plays in the team at Iron. Does he play? Yes. Oh, you run a team as yes. well? Okay, that's a good question. Gordon? Well, I could be here on the subject. Yeah. I really think it's incredible what we ask youngsters to do. We'll ask kids at eight year old and nine year old now to play in the leagues and they play offside, pushing up everything. They're all in the bad habits, first of all. We must replace street football because that's went missing. I myself wouldn't have organised leagues, organised 11 aside leagues until at least 11. I'd play in smaller pitches, smaller goals, where you have to be more skillful to score a goal. Now, if you go and watch the eight year olds, there's this little lad standing there with the jerseys down here and just lob anything at it. It's a goal. You know, there's no skill to that. And it's a shame for everybody else. But seven aside football, they can play anywhere. They don't get told when they're eight year old that they're a right back, a left back, they're a centre half. And they don't go anywhere for, until they go to a professional level. They're, for seven years they play in the one position. And I, I see them come to the youth, uh, youth team, and when they go out of that position, they don't know how to play in another position. <coughs> Let them play seven aside side football to about at least 11. Smaller goals, and they can play on, anywhere on the pitch. And when they physically develop, you can pick out positions for them. Mm. Let this, we'll need to get street mm. football back. What happens? In your situation, the team you currently run? Well, I run a team over in uh, Wyke, and uh, we're, we're in the under-11s this year in the Garforth League. Now, I think Gordon's aware of the Garforth League. Yeah. Um, he, he, he came down to Wyke, Manor Fields, the other year. He's been playing down there for Tranmere, I think it was. Was it Tranmere? Gavin plays for Yorkshire Amateur. And Craig plays for And my feelings are of the game itself. If the kids are left to do what they want to do on the field, that's great. But there's so much pressure from the sidelines, not the managers. It's the parents. parents. The parents are trying to emulate the kids what they haven't done. And they're putting so much pressure on them, it's unbelievable. And I just feel that also the injury side of things, that it's coming to TV now. I don't know how uh, bad it is, but they're on about kids now with uh, spine deformities and cracks in the spine, all from pressure of football. I'm just, I'm just a bit concerned on that side of things. I agree totally with you, what you're saying. I, I go watch, I watch maybe two games every Sunday with the kids. 
it's frightening, you know, and, 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 the, and the pressure put them under is absolutely frightening. And they play for all these medals. Mm. You go, you get asked to go along, you present medals, and you have a table longer than this, with all sorts of medals. You say, what did you win? They say, nothing. We just gave them this medal. The best turned out player of the year, top goal scorer player of the year. The manager's son, who's been playing well this year, gets a player of the year. <laughs> you know, and you get these medals along there, and I say to the woman, um, Instead of presenting us, can I not just come along for an hour and coach, coach your lads? Oh no, I don't want that. I want you to stand there and get your picture taken with me and my husband and... Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, there's far too much pressure on the kids. As I say, I could be here for another football, football show about this. It's, it's a subject... People talk about, about it all the time. But they never really do anything about it. I've seen loads of shows like this where they talk about it mm. and nobody puts anything into action. I love to see Leeds Council maybe it's three different sizes of pitches up to 11 year olds from 11 to 15 and over 15 so they get better areas to play on. Right, because well, the kids are only going to get better by having lots of touches on the ball. I mean how do you improve when you're doing a training exercise you have lots of touches of the ball and when you go into a game situation that as Gordon said if you play on a small pitch you've got a chance for seven or eight lads to have lots of touches of the ball and improve their techniques and improve their passing. If they're playing a full size pitch, A, they can't get up and down, and B, some of the lads might touch the ball three or four times. Four good players either yeah. side, and they That's get right. all the touches, the other seven stand yeah. about, and then it turns them off football. Yeah. Norman? Yeah. Well, I go into schools at the moment and do a bit of coaching in there, and uh, you've got to organise them, which is quite a shame, you know, like you should be able to say, right, let's, let's get a game, and you know what the kids turn around and say to you? When are we going to have a big game? When are we going to play 11 a side? Because they're used to it. What we've got to do, as Gordon said, is get them down to play little five a sides, three a sides, four a sides, anything where they get a touch of the ball and they can enjoy it and they can see and improve the skills. And as Gordon says, there should be something, some sort of scheme set up <coughs> by the FA or whatever, where you go into schools, people, ex-footballers, go into schools and who love the game and show them the skills and everything so, there's else. There's no problem about the medals. People say, oh, we, we need to win things, we need to play for medals. You don't, because when I remember when I played the street next to my street, oh, hell broke loose if you were losing. You know what I mean? The competitive spirit's inside you. A medal doesn't make up for what you're, you're playing for. It's, it's within you, your competitive spirit. You don't make anybody try any harder if you stick a medal in front of them. Sadly, we can't play it. in the streets anymore, can we? So we've got to find a... So you've got to find an way. alternative. We've got to organise it to a point in that way. But, because as you say, they can't play in the streets. But it's got to be done. It, well, you've got to get back. They do it on the continent, and they're way ahead of us in technique. They never play a full-sided game until they're 11, 12 year old. It's all five asides, it's all seven asides, and we still play the old system of 11 asides. Mm -hmm. Uh, Norman's hit the nail, nail on the head there. I'm involved in the same league, the Garforth League, and the problem we have is not the FA recognised football. The pressure tends to come from within the schools. There's conflict between the English Schools FA and the Football Association. As Norman says, the under-15s played at Wembley against a Dutch national side at under-15, and ours was a schoolboy side. Until those two bodies get together, we're going to have conflict. That is an age-old problem, right, isn't it? Yeah, then, yes. you'd be a lot of people losing their jobs then and that they'll miss out their expenses and their trips abroad then, and that could be a problem. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think, to be fair, that the FA and ESPA are actually trying to get together now to try and sort something out, and that was what I mentioned earlier about the better kids being not allowed to play more than 40 games. I mean, you, know, you mentioned my son before, he, he uh, had a situation at his school where he was playing for his school team, he got into the county team and then there was a, a district team in between. Now he'd got into the county team and he got a letter from his district saying, come for district trials. Now he was already in a county team, which was above the district team, and I said, I have rung back and said, look, it's, it's stupid, he's already in the county team, you know how he can play, if you want him, fine. And their attitude was, oh, well, if he doesn't come for the district trials, then he can't play for the county. Mm. Mm. Which is like, it's just Crazy. ridiculous, you know. Um, a point I'd like to put to Gordon, if I may. Um, you, you've just spoken about your own children in relationship to playing smaller size pitches, um, to improve skills and touch and so on and so forth, to come away from the robotic thing and the, the risk of young children. I'll, just taking it one stage further from that, Gordon, do you, do you miss uh, playing with Eric? Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a standard. Mm, that's another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice lad, Eric. But if I can sort of finish that, only because there seems to be some kind of fantasy happening with you and him, in as much as there was a telepathic thing between the two of you, which, in my personal opinion, could have taken Leeds United 
to beyond anything. Yeah. And Norman was saying before, with the twos and three million pounds being paid today on certain players, could you put a price on Eric Cantona? I don't know if it's telepathic, couldn't you speak to each other in the same language? <laughs> And there was no way Eric was learning English. So I decided I had to try French. And I felt a right fool one day running about trying to speak French to Eric. I thought, oh, forget this. But I agree with you. Eric's a magnificent player. You know, he's great to watch. Um, but Eric is gone now, and we wish him all the best at Manchester United. Uh, we've just got to get on with it. Yeah, we wish Eric all the best because you want to see good players playing at a high level. And Eric is a wonderful player. Uh, but Eric decided at that time that he would. I think, I think people forget that Eric did feel he wanted to go on at that time as well. And Eric's a free spirit. In Manchester United in about three months' time, if Eric feels like going, Eric will go. You know, he'll do that. That's what Eric will do. He's that type of guy. And that's the way he's made. And I don't think anybody should change him because that's what makes him a wonderful footballer mm. as well. Mm. Eric decided that it was time for Eric to go. And we all... And so but everybody gets on well with Eric here at this club. And as I said, we wish him all the best when he went. Good. OK. All right, we were talking about big games. There was a point over here about where they should be staged. The next big one is at Wembley Stadium. England against Poland. And England can't lose, Ray, can they? No, they can't lose. No, it's uh, no, the biggest game since probably the one that Norman took part in in, uh, in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> you did say you wanted to mention that, Yeah, you? it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a massive game and, uh, you know, unbelievable pressure on the manager especially and also the players that uh, are taking part in that game. But then that's what international football is about. I'm sure Scotland would love that pressure to try and win the game to actually go to this World Cup. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there's loads of things you could talk about about that England team, but I, I would presume that for everybody in, in here, they, they would want to know whether I think Gaza should play or not. And, uh, well, you know him better than anybody Yeah, well, my personal opinion is, is that he should play even if he's only 70% fit, because he is the one player in the England setup who can win a game off his own back, whether he's 100% fit or not. Who he's said, the one sorry, Ray, who said yeah. down here, over here? Okay, why should Gaza not be playing for England? I, I think he's typical of many megastars in that he's hyped. He's an excellent player, but he's abused his talent, quite frankly. And I'd rather see somebody like Glenn Hoddle fill in the midfield spot than Gascoigne, personally. <laughs> Muted applause. Who thinks Paul Gascoigne should be playing for England? Who thinks Paul Gascoigne shouldn't be playing for England? It's close, isn't it? More down the back here. Okay. All right. Norman, would you play Paul Gascoigne? Yeah, I'd play him. I think he's the best player we've got. I think uh, if he doesn't play, then England, in my opinion, don't stand much chance. Because uh, we're just looking at the, the squad here that uh, David Platt plays in midfield. Now, David Platt, his one asset is getting forward and getting in the box. Now, if Gascoigne doesn't play, there's nobody in that England side that's going to hold the ball up long enough, Ray and I were talking about it, that's going to give Platt that time to get in the box. Because that's what he is good at, and he's the best goal scorer we've got. Because there is some good midfielders, but there's nobody got Gascoigne's talent. So what against Sorry, old, we need the microphone. Sorry, just a moment, Danny. So what happened against Norway, Norman? I mean, I was there. Uh, Gascoigne was there and so was Platt and they were yes. diabolical. Yeah, I was there as well if I might take that question and I think the system was changed very very late. I stayed in the in the England hotel that night, the night before the game and they went out training and uh, spent time on that system and it obviously it didn't work and it didn't suit Gaza you know to have Lee Sharp in, in at left back having never played there for a long long time and international level to have him there was changing the system so much for such a vital game um, Gaza plays at his best when he's happy and he's not frustrated. He had that uh, Phantom of the Opera mask on, which he obviously wasn't happy with. That came off after 20 minutes and you could see the frustration in him. It just wasn't going to be his night. And when he gets like that, he gets so uptight and he, and he gets frustrated with himself, with everybody else around him and he doesn't play as he can play. But he, he obviously wasn't happy right from the start and you can tell how Gaza's going to play by seeing him in the dressing room. OK, well, there's plenty to discuss, I think, on this one. And we'll get a word on Scotland in a moment or so. Just a word, Gordon. Um, that's after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Footballers Football Show from Elland Road this week. We're with Ray Clements and Norman Hunter, Bill Fotherby, the managing director of Leeds United, and Gordon Strachan. We're talking for the moment about England. Paul Gascoigne, I think we've got a question down here on Paul Gascoigne. Yeah, yeah. Ray Clements passed the comment that we've got to keep uh, Paul Gascoigne happy, you know, and he's got to be nice when he comes out. Well, should the rest of the England team bend over Brackford's, you know, bring him his favourite breakfast and look after him? You know, there's ele sorry, 11 men out there on the pitch, not just one. So why should everybody bend over okay. backwards just Can for Paul Gascoigne? Right. Obviously having to go at me then. I will now say to you <laughs> what the Tottenham players thought of Paul Gascoigne in terms of they knew that Paul Gascoigne could win a game off his own back. The year that T Tottenham won the FA Cup, he either scored or made all the goals that got us to the FA Cup final. Gazza got injured in the FA Cup final. We all know it wasn't a correct tackle and uh, you know it nearly finished his career for him. The lads won the FA Cup. They came in after the game having won the FA Cup and, uh, you know, it's a magnificent feeling. You're, you're on the top of the ceiling. N you don't really think straight at all. But the lads got in the dressing room afterwards and the first thing they said is not let's wear the wives, let's get the champagne out. It's let's get in the bath, let's get on the bus, let's go to Princess Grace Hospital and see Gaza. Because they thought that much of him. And Gaza is the one player that I've seen who he could do anything. He could do anything in the dressing room. Norman's been in the dressing room, Gordon's been in the dressing room, where lads will play pranks, and some of them are over the top, and you get quite annoyed by it. But Gaza could do any of these things, and the lads would laugh at it with him, because he is such a popular character around the dressing room, around his own people, and he can win games for you. Thank you, he's a wonderful person. Again, back to the point, should you play guys going, I think I'm on the other side here. I don't know if you can trust him. When you play against Poland or wherever you've got to play, you need 11 lads <laughs> that you can trust. They've got to keep their mind focused on what they've got to do, not have anything distracting them from the game, which sometimes seems to be Gaza's problem because of his few problems. Just before he plays an international, there'll be this story about him being overweight or he's here, there and everywhere. You know, the cup final, he blew up in the cup final day. I mean, he wasn't mentally right. He was just right over the top. Um, I think against Poland you need to be 11 boys because you mightn't score right away. You'll just have to keep plugging away, plugging away, keep to the team system. And I think you'll need to pick 11 players that you can trust on the night. By the way, I think Gascoigne is the best football player we've had in the British Isles for years. Magnificent. But we hear horrendous stories about he can't, he can't run back and defend, he can't get forward now. I don't know because we're not seeing him, and, and probably Ray's not seeing him, we hear reports that he's 67. Who can tell what percentage he is fit? Talent, talent, I know that, God, but if you're not fit, you can't use your talent. You cannot. George Best well, could probably still keep a ball up, keep it up for 2,000 touches, hit a ball over there, but if you asked him to play in the Premier League tomorrow, he couldn't because he's no fit. Well, yeah. not Premier League. League. Internationals, is, uh, it's not the hustle and bustle International. in the internationals. Is, is in the Premier League. League. I still think that you, it's but, not so bad at the back there where you can lounge a boot. But up front in the midfield. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to play. point. If you've, got, if you've got somebody who's got talent, if I was playing alongside somebody who had talent, I would fetch and carry for him all day, and I'd give him the ball and I'd say, go on, you that's win, that, you you win that game That's for if you us. know he's going to produce it, as, as one of the guests says there, Norway, what harmed in Norway? Yeah, but he's bad. you've got to have a bad game, you can't just pick him one game. I, I know that, I know that, but, saying, but you must go, he didn't process. play well, there was a system was all wrong in Norway anyway, but you've got to, you've got to, I, my opinion anyway, if Gaza doesn't play, I cannot see us winning. You play in Poland, what are you on about? They must have got, they're not good players in England. 20 years Poland. ago, we were supposed to beat him, and I made a right you, mess of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but you made the whole of Scotland happy. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> but you mentioned, you mentioned there, going about not being able to play 100% fit. Get, going, but we keep going back to 91 because that was the year when he, was, you know, he, he did all the things that he did. Before the semi final. That's two years ago. It, yeah. It seems a long, long time ago in football, I'll tell you. Right. Well, yeah. you know that. So no, but, can I, but on that one, he had a hernia operation. I was operation. a good player in the World Cup in 82. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, they'll get to pick me for the next World Cup. You don't know, they're picking one or two now, <laughs> I'll tell you. In 91, he had a hernia operation three weeks before, or three and a half weeks before the semi final. Now, you know that it takes most people four to six weeks six to weeks. come back I from a hernia operation. operation yeah. Now, he played 45 minutes, no, sorry, 55 minutes at Norwich on the Wednesday. And then he played in the semi-final when he wasn't fit by any stretch of the imagination. Everybody in the coaching staff expected him to last 45 minutes at the best. If it had lasted 45 minutes, it got us into a 2-0 situation or a 2-1 situation through his magic. And then it would have been for the rest of the team to carry it on. As it was, he gave us another 
15, 20 minutes in the second half, which is a, so you can, even if you're not 100 percent fit and you have that ability, you can still influence. But you'd play him, Ray. You'd leave him out, Gordon. I think we've got that, yeah. 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 <laughs> can you stay between the bill? Because I'm not down there. <laughs> okay, oh. over here. I uh, just wonder how Graham Taylor expects England to win games when he continually ignores one of the most successful strikers in the game today, Mark Haightley. Yeah, yeah. Mark Haightley? Why isn't Mark Haightley in the England squad? Why isn't he playing, Norman? <laughs> well, it's <laughs> difficult, isn't it? Uh, the, the strikers... I think Mark Haightley's knocked a lot of goals in up, at, uh, up in Scotland, but I think uh, he's probably going for a, a younger combination. Mark Haightley's what now? That is old man. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. He'll go for he'll go for Ferdinand and he'll go for Wright. He'll go for Ferdinand and go for Wright. People who are uh, knocking them in and he sees them on a regular basis. Thirty one, eh, Gordon? He's getting all that one. Old, oh. <laughs> Our youngest questioner, welcome. Um, Gordon, why have Scotland got so many good players which have which have matched England's players? And why can they never do well in like, World Cup competitions? Good man. Good question. Well, I don't want to be away from home too long. <laughs> I think we've got another one over here on Scotland, Gordon. Okay. Where's my questioner on Scotland? Over here. Okay. Where is it? In we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to ask Gordon what he thinks of Andy Roxburgh's policy now of beginning to blood youngsters in the international team. Um, I don't think he's got an option. I don't think there's enough quality players. You've not got the Douglases, Sunes, Hansons anymore, the Bremners. I don't think they're about anymore. Getting back to that system I'm talking about, they, these lads play street football. I just don't think the quality players are there anymore. Um, the lads will probably be good, but I don't think they'll be legends like what we've been talking about here tonight. I hope they're good. I really do. I hope for the sake of Scotland, because I must admit that Andy Roxburgh's trying to do things up there. He's trying to get back the seven-a-side football. He's got a, a great future for Scottish football, for the kids. He's one man I think the coaches should have a look at down here, the way Andy Roxham was going about trying to organise kids. I don't know if I dare mention his name in here, but um, should Duncan Ferguson be in Scotland's senior squad rather than the under-20... <laughs> I thought so, rather than the under-21 squad. I think the reason in the 21 is that he's, he's only played half a game since he's got back, and I don't think he's ready yet for a full international. I think you can break him in the under-21. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the reason for that. Right. And we've heard, say, of changing systems at the last minute for the England team. Uh, we're often given dates when the team will be announced, but with unerring accuracy, the press tell us the day before what the team will be. And sometimes their, their, their criticism of the manager goes beyond the fair and reasonable. And I wondered what the panel thinks of the pressures on the, and how much the, the media influences the selection of the England team. Well, Norman's been there for a game like this, I mean, 20 years ago, as you said, Norman. What is it like, and are we a little unfair on those playing and managing? I think once a manager bows down and starts picking a team that the press want, I think then he's in all sorts of trouble. I think he's got to, all right, it's a tough job and you've got to just uh, pick what you think, pick the team and get on with it. Alf Ramsey did that. He, he changed it in uh, 73. He put one or, two of the, one or two players in that were going to, uh, it was their chance on the international scene. And unfortunately, we came up against a goalkeeper called Tomaszewski, who was a little bit useful on the night. And uh, we were never going to win that game. I think the 10 Polish players could have gone home and we could have sh had shots at Thomas Jeske and we would have never scored. But that was just how the game went. I think there's an awful lot of pressure in, uh, in management in general, but there's a lot of pressure on the England manager at the moment. And like Gordon says, I feel a little bit sorry for him because I don't think he's got as many players to pick from. When you think Alf Ramsey, when he won it in 66, had four or five world-class players in that side. And I think to qualify or to get close to winning the World Cup, you've got to have world-class players. Bill, I'm sorry we've left you alone for so long, but it has been very interesting, hasn't it? In a word, can England beat Poland? I think so. I hope so. For the sake of English football, I hope so. Gordon? For the sake of Scotland, um, I don't really care too much. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going across to support the, uh, the Republic of Ireland anyway in America. I hope England get there because there is good players in England, no, no doubt about that. There is. There is real good players and I think they'll look, look after Poland and I honestly think they'll beat Holland as well. I don't think Holland the force they used to be and I think England will qualify. Good luck to Scotland and Wales and the Republic of course. Norman? Well, I hope they qualify. I really, really do. But I think it's slightly stacked against them. Do you? Yeah. It's ominous. Ray? 
I think everybody in the room hopes they qualify. I mean, it's been a magnificent World Cup in America, and uh, I think they will qualify. I think they'll win this game and, and get at least a point in Holland. And, uh, you know, the nation will be behind them. You know, Graham Taylor has taken a lot of stick and a lot of personal stick as well, which I think is over the top. But uh, the nation will be right behind you when it comes to that Wednesday night. And I'm sure they'll do well on the day. OK, well, uh, we are not on the road with the show next week because we've got the Under-21 game live from Millwall, of course. But we are with you the following week from St James's Park. That's Newcastle United, of course. There's no need to laugh over there. <laughs> Keep your letters coming in. Haven't got round to mentioning too many this week, but it's the Footballers Football Show on the road. Sky Sports, PO Box 6, Isleworth Middlesex, TW75, QQ. Ray Clements, Norman Hunter, Bill Fotherby, Gordon Strachan. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. And thank you for having us, Alan Rowe.